Sober Smash. Smash. Get to the core issues with King Scott and get Sober Smash. And welcome to Sober Smash Live. Today's special guest, we've got Don Prince, going to be talking about fighting the devil within, addiction, PTSD, and everything else. But right now, let's take it to the man with the plan, the one and only, King Scott. What's up, Jonesy? How you doing, buddy? I am doing great, Scott. How good, are you? Good to see you, man. Good it's to been see a, you. We've been a couple of weeks. We, you know, we have a little vacay and well, a little, uh, a little of everything. Call it. That's not fair because I don't think it's. I vacay. was in Rochester, New York, and you were in Italy. That's not fair to call it. Mine was a vacation. Oh, it's pretty pretty similar, I guess. <laughs> right? Pretty similar. A couple miles away. <laughs> not even close. Pal. Food might be a little different. You know, you're, you're talking good Italian food versus uh, dinosaur barbecue. I had dinosaur barbecue, so good, I'm a happy. Probably guy. good buffalo wings up there, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that originate up in that area. You know what? That's like the ch- which came first, chicken or the egg. People fight over whether buffalo wings chicken actually did. came from buffalo or not. Right, um, right, right. But uh, we'll go with it. We'll go with it. I've never seen a buffalo with wings anyway. How's the opioid uh, crisis up there? Pretty bad. You know, they're struggling just like everyone else. Uh, you know, because it seems like everything in the news today, uh, all week has been, you know. Uh, Everyone's starting to recognize that we have a problem. Well, you know, we know the president has got a commission uh, going, or you know, the uh, uh, Chris Christie's heading up one of the commissions. And every it's about it time, seems like right? every place, every place you go, Chicago's got a big issue going on right, right now. Everybody's right. got an issue. I, I mean, every state that I travel here. Everyone's coming up to me going, we're the worst place in the country. And, you know, yeah. I go to Detroit, I hear it. I go out to L.A. Everyone's coming up to me going, you, you guys need to come here and help us fight the problem. <clears throat> and and I tell them, you know, it, I know you got a problem here, but it, it's not just here in L.A. or Detroit or Wisconsin. It's a problem everywhere. And it's yeah. not getting any better right now it's getting worse i think what's shocking and people are figuring out and we see it working in in treatment and helping people small town usa is getting hit hard absolutely small towns where it used to be the norman rock rockwell perfect little towns right they're getting buried in in not just opioids but all sorts of drugs and alcohol abuse issues sure sure you know you're not going to the general store to buy a bale of hay anymore you're going there to score heroin (laughs) (laughs) it's getting it's getting crazy you know with something like that you know it was darn kids with their bales of hay let me tell you, you know, exactly exactly <laughs> load up the truck they're loading it up a little different today oh yeah yeah it's a little different animal and, but, and that's um, that's definitely a problem well increased awareness is the first thing and i think that if everybody realizes nobody's immune uh there's no safe place from this right the biggest way to fight it is to gain awareness exactly and, and i think the government is doing something now different they're, they're putting funding aside yeah to the you know to combat the problem and you know i see in florida you know there's a, a lot of new agencies coming in to help you yeah. know try to clean this up a little bit and i think it's what needs to be done Absolutely. And if everything could get in line at one point, the perfect world is, you know, the government understands, uh, Mr. and Mrs. America understand, and the insurance companies understand, and treatment centers are all on the same page. That's when we'll start to win. But we're still working towards that. Uh, absolutely. It's gonna. It's a lot more work, but I think it's going in the right direction. Absolutely. And that's what's important. Yes. There's changes to be made, and uh, people are starting to listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think you made a good point about Hometown USA. You know, people start listening when it happens to them. And like I always said, everybody has somebody that is affected by this disease, whether it's your immediate family, your next door neighbor, someone in your church, but someone you know is affected. You know, you were uh, overseas. I mean, did you happen to notice anything? Are they battling similar problems? You know, you know, it's a little different, I think, in Europe than it is here. They definitely have the problem, but people don't want to talk about it. It's uh-huh. like let's brush it under the carpet. You know, eh, he'll straighten out. They don't. They don't recognize it as we do here as much. Uh, we're a little more open to it and try to have you know a solution to the problem. I think the European market is a little different where, you know, eh, it'll straighten out, whatever. You think it has a little bit to do with the tight-knit 
European family. I think it does. That it's a little more like we I keep think it, it does. In the family, a little more private. About it. They're absolutely a little more private. You know, uh, you know, here in the states, people like to put their laundry out and let everybody <laughs> look at it, and uh, which is isn't such a bad thing because you need help, right? And that's right. why we're here to help you. Absolutely. You know, and you should never be ashamed of what's going on in your life. And uh, if there's a problem, you know, you, you need help, just say something. And we're the ones to help you. Right. We'll never say no. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, don't turn away, folks. Uh, and pay attention to what's going on. Never think it's not going to involve you because I guarantee somebody you know somewhere is suffering right now. Absolutely. And your awareness might be the thing that's going to help them. Absolutely. All right. That Tell was one guy. That was one deep. guy. One guy that could probably use it right now. This guy in North Korea. Oh you know, no! I'm watching the news this morning. <laughs> you know, this guy definitely should be calling in and, and trying to get himself into treatment. I don't know what the heck he's doing. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, I'm sorry. As long as we're going there, I mean, there's got to be something wrong with him. Have you seen the haircut? The, the, the hair? <laughs> you know, mine's not too far off though. I can't. I can't throw stones at glass from a glass house here. Yeah, but I who mean, walks into the barber and says, "Give me the Mo Howard"? Exactly. Right? I mean, exactly. come on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, we have a great guest today. Yes, we do. We do. Let's see if we can get him in here. All right. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking to uh, Don Prince. Uh, he's going to be talking about fighting the devil within, um, and he's going to tell us all about himself. Uh, very involved in helping people with all there sorts of trauma and There's addictions the man and everything the else. And there he is, Mr. Don Prince. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, thanks. Great. We Welcome. Should. Thank you. A little golf clap. <laughs> there we go. Good to see you, Don. Thank you. So, Don, tell us about you. You know, we were reading your bio about what you're doing. And it's very impressive. Thank you. You're definitely out there doing the right thing and helping people, which we applaud, man. I appreciate that. It's great. You know, and if anybody has any questions for Don or Jonesy or myself, you can always write in on Facebook and uh, we'll get you your questions answered as fast as possible. So, right along. So tell us, Don. Tell us about what you're doing and fighting the cause, and we'd love to hear. It's fantastic. I was talking um, to Karen outside before I came in, and um, I just gave him a quick, like, Reader's Digest about what got me to, to be in front of you guys today. Sure. And, um, <clears throat> you know, you had mentioned a few minutes ago, I was watching in the other room, about um, how we've all, everybody's lives been in, in, in touched by somebody we know or whatever. And I think <clears throat> um, one of the important things to remember is those lives are not always just our loved ones. Um, I'm a former firefighter from New York on Long Island. I um, served down 9-11 for a short period of time. I am um, not a firefighter and I'm not chief of my department um, because I was asked to resign um, about mm, 12 years ago um, because of my drinking and where it took me. Um, and um, so now my concentration is um, sober six years, July 13th, by the way. And um, Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and my, my purpose now is to try to help those um, that were on the job, so to speak, um, like I was, to find their way um, before it takes them where it took me. Uh, the concentration, like I said, mostly is I have, um, I'm able to... Communicate at a level where maybe a cop or a fireman or another type responder, I know the lingo enough to make them feel comfortable. As much as there is that stigma you guys were talking about earlier as well, um, for the general population, that level of stigmatization, stigmatizing goes way beyond that within um, the first responder community. Uh, because Absolutely. The, the, the drinking is part of the culture. Um, whether you're a cop or a fireman or a paramedic, or, you know, that's part of your release at the end of the shift or whatever it might be. So when you can't do that anymore, you're kind of like um, on the outs a little bit. Sure. And then the other thing is if you go to get help for that, you're um, looked at like, oh, is that guy, is, he couldn't handle the vodka. Is he going to be able to handle backing me up on a call? And so that you're somewhat potential. At least I think some of that tied is turning but not fast enough so then you're like second guessed um you know or uh, the potential to so how it's addressed and how it's how we approach um the responder community is a little bit more unique although i guess it could run parallel to other prof uh, professionals or mm -hmm. doctors nurses whatever so but there we're a unique breed and we um are a little bit different than most 
you know, I think the easiest or the most common um, analogy was, you know, we're running into burning buildings when everybody else is running out. Right. Um, we don't like to ask for help. We're the ones giving the help. We're not the ones that need to be picked up unless, you know, it's something catastrophic. We, we were the ones that are doing the picking up. So to get us where we need to be takes a little bit more work. Um, but like I said earlier, I think that uh, some of that stigma is turning. Um, at least some more, a little I bit think, more. I think it is. More on the maybe mental health side, on the PTSD <laughs> and trauma side. Um, I think we're still working on the addiction part. But that part of it alone, because of the awareness about first responder suicides and mental health awareness between cops and firemen and everybody else, that, that is a little bit more easy for people to deal with. And um, I, I gave a, a, a speech a few months ago up in New York for NYPD mm-hmm. with a lot of chief of police up there. And, um, you know, the biggest thing was the people were coming up to me. Young cadets were asking, you know, hey, listen, if I say something, do I lose my badge and my gun? Am I off the job? And I sat there for an hour in a room and spoke to, you know, the elders that have been on the mm-hmm. force for 25, 30 years. And convincing them that you know you have to look at things a little different today you know not the way it was years ago hey this guy's drinking he's doing drugs pull his badges his gun you're off the job we don't hear about it i said you can't do that today life has changed and when i asked the question with everyone in the room i must have had i guess 30 40 you know cops in a room and um i said raise your hand if if you've been affected by any type of drug addiction alcohol while you've been on the job here, do you know someone, your family, or anyone else? Every person raised their hand mm-hmm. in that room. Mm-hmm. And by the time I was done speaking, everybody had tears in their eyes. I said, you can't get rid of somebody because there's an issue like this. We have to fix them and get them back on the job. Mm-hmm. So if you're a young cadet and you just graduated the academy and you have an issue, you need to tell us now. Or come to us while you're on the job and say, listen, I got a problem but I don't want to lose my job. Mm -hmm. We're going to help you. We're not kicking you off the job. We're going to get you back on the job as fast as possible. And you will never lose your job like that. Mm -hmm. We might take your gun away right now. You're not going to be out there with your gun, but you know, you'll have your badge and gun back. You need to trust us. Finish the program. Let's get you on the right path. You'll be in, you know, a sober lifestyle and it's something you're going to have to work towards, you know, the rest of your life with this. And you know what? They all agreed. The other uh, conversely about your point about you know taking the gun and the badge back in the day, yeah. Um, actually, in my experience, in my own personal experience as well, is sometimes the opposite. It was like you know what, Scott, let go on the back to sleep that one off, or we'll cover your shift, yeah. or we'll turn the other way. I hid behind my badge when I was assistant chief in chief because who's going to suspect me? I right. was I responded sure. after drinking. They're everyone's looking up to you. Look at man, this thing can't be the fire chief. You're the he's, man. He's not the guy, not the right. lieutenant, not the cop. Sure. And you know, just go sleep it off, and we'll cover your shift, and you know those kind of things um, that per- perpetuated my um, drinking because it was justified, or at least. Um, qualified that it was okay, right. and so I you think know, and it's a, a tough job you have mm-hmm. every day. I mean, yeah. you're, you're seeing things that people will never see in their lifetime, and, and you you need to go home after that and see your family and act like <laughs> everything's fine. You know, the, and the other the, the other point you made up uh, or you made rather was um, about asking for help and taking your the gun and badge away. Sure. That um, there's places like Chicago, the state of Illinois, that if you do ask for help and it's documented that you ask for help, you lose your gun permit. So if you're a police officer and you ask for help and they pull your gun permit, there's yeah. a good chance you'll never get that back. They're, that's the end of your career. Right. So you've got places where that um, th- that needs to be addressed because the guys will be not answer up because they're going to lose sure. their jobs over it. So it sounds to me like, I mean, just the point both you and Scott have made is uh, dealing with the addict or the person with, this, with a substance abuse problem uh, is one animal. But the real problem is educating first responders as a whole, mm-hmm. as the industry, to educate them and let them know that there is a path back from this addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, They can no longer just have absolutes. Uh, That's where the real battle is right now, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Because once you find somebody with a problem, you treat the problem. But how do you treat thinking uh, of an (laughs) industry-wide thinking? Mm -hmm. How do you fix that? It's difficult. Don, I got a question here on Facebook. Chen's asking uh, to, to you: Since you're an environment, you work the environment you work in consists of drinking. What are some of the tools you use to get through the cravings? 
Well, me personally, um, I didn't have to deal with that because I had already been asked to resign. Um, and from not only being chief, but from the department. And that happened on a Sunday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I was in a complete blackout. And I got a knock on the door from two board, uh, members of the Board of Fire Commissioners and one of my assistant chiefs. And they said, Wilson, Don, we're sorry, but can you sign these paperwork? We need your keys to your truck and your, and then a firehouse. We, you know, you're done. Um, so I didn't have to deal with... Um, you know, being in sobriety and going back to the firehouse again. Right, right. But I think that, um, and there is going to be those guys that, are, like I said earlier, are going to bust chops about that with certain people. But I also think that to answer her question, um, to be honest about it and to know what your limitations are and have your your escape route and, and, and let people know. And, you know, the thing about firehouses and police stations are they're bigger rumor mills than grade school and junior high school. So, Everybody knew that I had a problem except me. And not just from my department, from agencies that we worked with and everything else. So when someone's going back in after they, you know, disappear for 30 days or whatever it was and they go back on the job, um, everybody already knew what the issue was for the most part. So they're either going to accept you back and and welcome you in and you don't have to worry about being guarded about it. Um, But there it all depends on, that can also vary from agency to agency because there's some people that welcome people back open arms. And then the other people are like, you know what? You should have sucked it up, Buttercup. You shouldn't have done that. You didn't have to do that. You're just weak. And those are the people that are that are getting hurt with it, or yeah, that are getting that absolutely. kind of feedback from their agencies. And they're, it's more so than you'd like to believe. So how does somebody survive with that, though? I mean, if you do go back into that culture, because it is such a big part of the culture. And I, I know dealing with some, some people who are in the firefighting uh, profession, mm-hmm. uh, listen, there's, most firehouses have a bar out back. I mean, they've got the sheds. They've got the different things in there. It's a big part of the culture. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you counsel somebody that if they love the job they do, how do you survive that when it's right there in front of you like that? I mean, it, it's a shame to give up what you love. Well, but sometimes, as we all know, that right. you know, people, places, and things. It sounds a little cliche, but sometimes that might be an option. And then you know, look at the you know, was the drinking because of the job, and is that the right job for you? You know, going right. back to being a paramedic and when you're having issues with blood and, and, and or scenes and stuff like that um, without the right therapy, maybe that's not what you need to do. Maybe you, instead of riding on an ambulance, you need to go sell ambulances or design medical equipment or whatever it might be. Um, so you have alternatives. Um, it, it's, it's tough. It's a tough nut no matter how you do it. So right. there's, I don't know what the answer to that question is personally. Right. Um, you know, us people in recovery that um, we go out with family members at, at, to a, a restaurant where there's drinking, we handle it a certain way. And I don't sure. think you get you have to turn that on or use that same those same tools at the firehouse or the at the station house or whatever it might be as you do in any other situation. Okay, okay you got a couple more questions here on Facebook. Here's one from Shabli. She wants to know how would a family member go about getting help for their loved one? Should they notify the captain or seek help externally? Externally. I think getting back to my rumor mill um, thing about the uh, most fire departments and, and police departments is um, I think you need to be very, very stealth and you need to be very, very quiet about it um, because you don't know who that captain is and what that captain's attitude might be. And he might be the guy that's going to that'll be the end of someone's career or at least they'll be on a desk or whatever for once that comes out. So it's very, very important to um, deal with a third party that's trusted. Um, you know, one of the reasons I became an interventionist and got certified in recovery coaches so that people could reach out to me at that level and separate it, you know, even from the EAP, because as much as the EAP is supposed to be right. compliant, nobody knows and this, nobody knows that. Right. People have the potential finding out, and that could be career ending. And then you have the resentment of that person saying, Scott, why did you call to my captain? Why did you go to the chief? Sure. Um, so it could actually cause more yeah, harm. More animosity good right there. Within the, the family. They'll have it into you for, mm-hmm. for the job. Yep. Yep. So it's got to be, wow. be very, very careful and very, very discreet. Okay. Got another question from Kim. Hey, Kim. Uh, as a proud mom to my daughter serving in the Navy, I was wondering if you have noticed the rise of PTSD diagnosis that is contributing to the rise of drug and alcohol use. Also, how is this dealt with when they obviously need some sort of medical assistance? This has become a huge problem and suicide has become almost an epidemic. <clears throat> That's true. The, if you know what the the, the word uh, the number twenty two um, is out there on mission twenty two or the twenty two right. veterans that the um, the VA is reporting that um, take their own lives every single day because of exactly what um, she's asking about. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank her for her daughter's service as well and the family sacrifice because the family 
um, you know, you're giving up your daughter for to protect us, and I appreciate that very much, as we all should. Absolutely. Um, yes. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but, yes, the PTSD. You know what? PTSD has always been around. It's always been around. We used to call it shell shock. They used to call it battle fatigue. Right. You know, right. I mean, and, and back, so it's been around since I'm sure the, the Roman, <laughs> the gladiators had PTSD. They just didn't know it at the time. Um, and so um, I think we're just the awareness of it. It's not so much a rise in it. I think it's more of an awareness and a looking out for it so that um, people can get the help that they need before it takes them someplace that they don't want to be. Um, so and, and to her answer, too, is that. Um, Sometimes the diagnosis, when it does come through, and the limited amount of um, exposure, whether it be through the VA or wherever, to get the help that they need, some of the therapy models and some of the protocols are not necessarily beneficial for that veteran because uh, the status of where that is um, in that part of the, the health benefit for, for our veterans. And I think there's, there's, there needs to be a lot of room of, 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 for improvement in that, in that respect. So. All right, we got to take a short break. I see a lot of questions here for Don, so uh, we'll get to as many as we can right after the break. Stand by. substance abuse facility. Our trained professionals first focus on finding the core issues in trauma that lead to addiction. With some of the best doctors, nurses, and behavioral health techs the industry has to offer. We offer personalized one-on-one -on -one therapy five days a week, raising the bar to a higher level of standards. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, gambling, sex and love addiction, or even relationship addiction, Treatment Partners of America has specialists to treat and to help heal your addiction long term rather than attempt a temporary 30 day quick fix. Welcome back to Sober Smash Live. Our special guest today is Mr. Don Prince. We're talking about uh, first responders, PTSD, and addiction. And uh, Scott, take it away. You know, I see we're getting a lot of the same questions on Facebook. People are asking, do they offer any free programs or therapy for firefighters? What resources are out there for the family members? This seems to be a common question I'm seeing. So uh, I'm going to let Don answer that question and see if we can get you the answers you're looking for. Our country is covered by about 70% volunteer firefighters. Generally, it's a, and then the 30% is the paid um, firefighters. Wow, it's that high. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did not know that. Mm -hmm. So and there's the organizations, national organizations, both for the volunteer side and the professional side. Um, the International Association of Firefighters has a program that they just started and opened up in Maryland, um, and they have resources for those guys. Um, and then there, there's another national organization for the volunteer service, um, and they've partnered with some uh, places that have some good resources and not so good resources, right. just like anything else. Sure. Um, so th th there's not more than that that I know, um, but there's um, just to fall back what I said earlier about being discreet and being um, you know stealthy as possible about it. You need to find that individual or that that independent person um, that can. <coughs> give you that right advice um, and, and do it in such a way so that we don't have an issue like we talked about as far as the job goes. So, Okay. okay. Excellent. All righty. So, so tell us what you're doing, Don, with the... I know you have a whole program together. Yep. I think, tell us about that. Sure. Um, I just recently, because one of the big frustrations I, I found doing what I do now was, um, yes, we have addicted firefighters and police officers and first responders. We have problems. Some of it's from injuries, and it's not always just drinking. Right, right. You know, um, it's injuries on the job, and then just like any other opiate addiction, and you Prescription runs out, and then you do things that you would never think you'd ever do. So there's that component as well. Um, but it, one of the big frustrations I had was phone calls I'd get saying, I don't, I don't even take an aspirin. 
And I'm not going to take what the doctor gave me because I don't believe in that stuff or whatever it might be, but I can't sleep at night and I've got nightmares. I am screaming and I am beating my partner in bed in my, in my, with my fist because I don't even know I'm doing that. And this, that, these kind of symptoms and kind of by, um, episodes ha- cover you know, any of us with, with trauma, PTSD, sure. not just first responders or veterans, but, um, but and I, I couldn't help those people because so many of our treatment centers, you have to have that primary diagnosis of some kind of addiction to something, and then we'll secondarily treat your, your trauma and your PTSD. So I was just felt helpless, honestly. There's a couple of programs that specifically um, deal with trauma and PTSD for first responders. Um, they're very, very good programs. One's on the East Coast out in California. The one's up in Massachusetts. Um, and they do amazing work, um, except there's usually a generally a very long waiting period to get into them because of the way they're set up. Right. So I was introduced to a friend of mine who's now a very good friend of mine and my, my co-founder um, in an organization and a, and a program we called uh, put together called The 11th Hour. And what The 11th Hour is, is um, first responder-based um, trauma, PTSD, intensive therapy we do small groups it's very discreet very very intimate four to uh, two to four people at a time for um for now anyway because we are right. you know, just launching this so um and with that um we don't deal with any kind of drug addiction obviously or anything like that um it's strictly the sh- trauma strictly trauma it's emdr based um which is um proven to be more and more the uh, i'm not going to say the, the magic pill there's no such thing as a magic pill for ptsd and trauma but it's obviously the most, one of the more, more effective uh, therapy yes. methods. Um, so we put that together, and we're doing five-day intensives um, that, again, like I said, deal with just with the trauma and PTSD. Um, and that's something that I'm very proud to be able to offer now because we're opening up some more doors. Um, and the difference with ours is that that EMDR concentration is upwards of, of 10 to 12 hours in that five-day period, depending on how you're reacting to it. So we've seen, and I've personally witnessed... Um, some just amazing, amazing transformations in people in those sh- short five days because of the work that we're doing. And um, so it's, it's pretty cool stuff. I'm curious, uh, with the people you work with and, and other first responders, how many of them really have no idea that how affected they are by trauma? I mean, how many of them just, they either don't know that they've got PTSD or they might think that they've got it under control and they don't realize how deep it goes. Do you run across that a lot? Mm, generally, by the time I, they, they're calling me, the, they've it, lost it, everything. It, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I think, but, and there was one, that one Facebook question that came up earlier as far as, um, how does the family recognize or help or whatever? I think the family, the wife, the husband, the children uh, recognize it in you before, way before you do because of your behaviors and your, your, your coworkers as well. You know, when you, if you're not, your, your whole history was get to the firehouse an hour before your shift and stay after an hour and maybe everything is already done as opposed to at, at, if your shift is over at seven, you're either at seven five. And if you're your shift starts at seven in the morning. The next morning, you're there at six fifty-five, and that that you're you're right. withdrawing and everything else, and separating yourself because you can't stand to be there anymore. Which is very similar to substance abuse. Absolutely true. You know, and, yeah, very and, similar. And so many times that there again to fall back into that. Is, <clears throat> it is, it and it is. then um, then you start planning your drinking around your shifts. If you right. got seventy-two on forty or forty-eight on seventy-two off, you know that you know before your forty-ninth hour or whatever it is that you know when you got to stop to come in. Hopefully without anything on your, you know, and, and God, you know, you come in and you're an engineer or a chauffeur and you have a fender bender with a rig and everybody yeah. gets tested and you didn't wait long enough um, you know wow. there's only so many breath mints that's going to cover that and that was um, I was lucky enough never to have that happen to me um, but certainly that's the risk you take by not have you seen that happen on a job what's that a situation like that oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah yep absolutely yep and it should have happened to me and I'm not proud of that fact and right. I probably um, you know put people's da- I know I put people's lives in danger including my firefighters and right. and um, you know that's the part of me that keeps me so focused on asking these other guys to accept the help when they need it. Sure, you've been so there. So it doesn't, doesn't take them to where a loss of my first marriage and, um, you know, not being there for my kids as they were growing up and, right. and you know, not ha- and having the stigma of having to resign and being that guy. Oh, you, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the fire department had that chief that had to quit because he was a drunk. Well, you know, that got me to where I am today, but, you know, it's part of my story. Sure. Um, but it's not. It didn't didn't have to be. But I let it because I I was too afraid to ask for help. I was too stigmatized, and I couldn't be a part of. And um, and obviously don't think that way anymore. Sure. Um, and it's easy for me to say, 
um, because I live through it as opposed to the guy that doesn't or is not ready to give it up or still feel like he's going to be ostracized because of it. Um, but sooner or later, we all got to face that face that devil. And absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. And PTSD is so hard um, because... Uh, a traumatic event to one person might not be traumatic to the next person and there's no there's no uh, the connecting factor is how the PT, how the trauma affects you mm -hmm. but there's no connecting fiber in the traumas themselves because everybody reacts differently to situations so I mean uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be a huge event to nope. make a major trauma in you it could be something where somebody else might think <clears throat> that's no big deal but to you it could be there's two things about that, especially on the job. Um, the cumulative effect of the little right. calls, little calls, little calls, little calls. You know we're nothing, but you got to get up from your meal. You got to get up at three o'clock in the morning for that same alarm that's going off again or whatever. Um, and then you get the animosity and you get the anger of why can't I sleep because I know this is an, this alarm is not real. And but and then so that builds up the anger and, and that turns into trauma. Then the other side of the coin is like you said, it's not always the big event. But what we found here at Eleventh Hour, especially, is because of the work with the EMDR. 90% of the time, it's something that happened to you in your earlier life, childhood, um, you know, growing up you know, and something before. And what your triggers on the job are is taking you back to what happened to you before. So, you know, if it's a, uh, an car accident, per se, and you, you're cutting your car open and you're taking the door off and you remember that your aunt died in a car accident and, you know, they had to cut her out of the car. So now it's re-traumatizing whatever that might be in your, in your earlier life. And we start that's where we start the healing process. You do a timeline when you come in with us from your first memory until the day you're sitting there writing your timeline um, and everything in between that you can remember. And when we start the, the therapy process with EMDR, we fix what happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago because if you don't fix that first, anything that happens on the job is gonna, might have the potential of taking you back there. So you don't right. fix the old, you can't keep up with the new. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I, what's the length of your program, Don? It's, it's it, what's different between what we're doing and with addiction treatment is it's a very short term. It's five days. Five days. Five days. Um, eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning, depending on the day, um, till generally four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, however, when we're doing the EMDR process the way we're doing it, if someone's in there and they are not be able to close the issue that they're working on. If we need to stay there till midnight to get that person to where they need to be to be able to you know rest that evening, sure. um, the program will continue until such time as that person is ready to go home in the evening. So um, it's very short term, as opposed to again having to go to a let's say a thirty day program for addiction that you may or may not have, hoping that you're going to get something out of it where here it's you're in you're out five days later and you continue your process at home um we do follow up and make sure that you are gonna if you're gonna go see uh, your clinician afterwards that you're gonna that you actually do that um and the other amazing thing about this emdr thing so to speak is that it continues working in your brain five to seven days after you leave so we're doing a five-day program but this person is getting that process going upwards of 10 days total right. Um, and and I've had guys call me up, and just recently, two days ago, I had one of our firefighters that came from out west, and he, uh, he called me because I don't know what happened the other day. I woke up, and I was flat. I was completely flat. I wasn't at no emotion and no nothing. My wife, and my kids went out to the store. I was sitting home, and he got worried, and he um, called a clinician friend of his, mm -hmm. and he said, "Mary, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what she did to me. I think she wiped out my brain over there because <laughs> I, I'm not thinking." And and um, <laughs> And his clinician, Fred, said, you know what? No, it's not that. And he said, whoever did the work you did um, and did the MDR with you did it right because that's exactly what you're supposed to be feeling. Yeah. And it, you are experiencing it after you leave. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to be able to hear that even on the outside that we're getting that kind of response. Or it sounds from like you're doing some great things. So it's, definitely, it. it's definitely needed. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is we're going to put Don's contact up on our site. So uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, Don, absolutely, we'll, we'll put all your information up there and uh, support them and if you need help, you know, first responders, he's doing the right thing. He's the one to call and, uh, you know, let him, let him help what you need, really. Ask for the help. Thank you. Don, if you, had a chance, if you had a chance to, to just tell everybody one message that you think they need to hear, whether it's the first responders or the people in charge, what do you want them to know? To the first responders? Yeah. And it's easy again for me to say this, but you're not alone. 
You know, the first story I put out about myself was my whole life story. I called it Fighting the Devil Within, and I told everything about me. And the biggest, most common over and over and over again, and still happens to this day, I got, the response I got was, oh my God, Chief, thank you for putting out there. I'm not the only person I thought I was, and I couldn't talk about this. So, um, you know, get over that hump. You know, get over the fact that you need to reach out to somebody and, you know, find that comfortable level of of person, of where you can reach out to, that you're not going to worry about repercussions and get the help without, you know, without having to go through what I went through and so many other other people like me to go through. Very well said. So you're not alone. Excellent. Very well said. Also, I'd like to talk about what's coming up this week. We have a, a new sponsor, an addict program that's getting launched tomorrow by Fellowship Living Facilities, Treatment Partners America, and FAR. It's going to be uh, launched in Florida, and uh, we'll be posting some information on that. Something to look forward to. It's called Sponsor an Addict. And uh, we're going to try to help as many people that need treatment that's out there that's not able to get it and give them a helping hand. Sort of what, what Don's doing for the first responders and uh, try to save some lives together. Yeah, invest in recovery, people. Absolutely. Don, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Very informative, and uh, you've been Sober Smash. Thank you. Sober Smash. Thanks.